What's your take on fake coding experience in Java? Difference between REST and GraphQL. What's your take on people still using Java 8? People are comfortable with Java 8. That's the problem, right? It works, it's not a big deal. So unless something goes really bad, they are not going to care. And these kind of things are going to happen more and more over time, right? So the security vulnerabilities are going to get more and more over time. Or you have to pay some company a lot of money to keep you at Java 8, which is really no, there's really no point in you staying in Java 8 anymore. You have to move on. You have to get to the latest LTS version, at least. If you are on Java 8, please know that the more you delay, the tougher it's going to be. Okay, so there's one hurdle, which is the Java 9 modularity, that one hurdle that you're going to have to go through. But after you go through, it's pretty much smooth sailing. There's not a lot of difference between uh, migrating to Java 11 versus migrating to Java 17, which is the latest LTS. So just, just do it, just do it, just do it. That's what I would suggest. How to roll back all transactions in microservices, see if any one transaction Looks like there's a transaction failure there. That's the patch. You 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 have made a partial commit in your comment. There was a transaction failure. I'm gonna guess what your what your comment is, right? How do you roll back transactions in microservices and distributed architectures? There are a lot of different ways in which you coordinate transactions. So when you think about transaction managing transactions in uh, microservices, distributed architectures, you have to handle all of them, right? You have to handle the concept of a commit, which is basically do transact, you know, do multiple writes and then make it all or nothing, right? That's the point of a transaction. So the concept of transaction itself implies that you might need rollback. So how do you do it when you have distributed systems? So um, the most common pattern today is using something called the saga pattern. Okay, there is a concept of a saga, which is basically like a, a story, right? Somebody is telling a story. They say, okay, you go do this thing. You go do this other thing. You go do this other thing. All right. Are you all ready? Are you all done? Okay, now you all commit. Okay, so that's basically there is a third party or like the end party who is kind of observing and monitoring and all that and making sure that everything goes through, right? And there are different ways to approach this. There is something called orchestration. And there is something called a choreography, right? So it's basically both of these imply that there is some neutral party which is coordinating all these transactions. That's basically how um, how transactions work. It's it's a challenge. It is it is difficult. Difference between REST and GraphQL. You folks must know what REST is, right? REST is a mechanism in which kind of a protocol in which uh, a client communicates with the server over the internet. I don't know why I'm doing these double quotes, but a lot of those terms have nuances. I think that's the reason why I'm doing this. REST is a protocol. I don't know if you can call it an official protocol. It doesn't have a spec. Okay. It doesn't have a formal spec. It's more of like a best practice way of having something, send a request to something else and then having that thing respond back. Okay. So you have all these HTTP methods and HTTP verbs and all that stuff. You're basically leveraging the HTTP protocol of communication and kind of layering in another protocol, again, double quotes, it's not a spec, like I said, some understanding of like, okay, when this HTTP request is done, you know, the context of the HTTP, like if it's a get, it means something. If it's a post, it means something. And the URL means something and so on, right? So it's a way for you to exchange data online. And a lot of APIs use REST as a way to exchange, like a client to extract data from an API and to write data to an API. So you build web applications using REST, right? You have a, a client which makes all these calls to get data. What usually ends up happening is a single page load for a web application usually needs to make multiple REST calls. Okay, Just think of a, a, a web page like Amazon, right? You go to Amazon, imagine that's a, a front-end client and it's making these multiple calls to the backend API because it needs to show a bunch of stuff, right? It needs to show your icon at the top, like your name and icon saying you're registered, you're logged in. It needs to show top products it needs to show your current orders or whatever. These are possibly different APIs. So you can imagine your page is making all these different calls to different REST APIs to get all that information. I don't think Amazon is a single page application which does these calls, but just an example, right? When 
a page needs to make 10 different REST API calls to just load one page. You can imagine that's a problem, right? Those calls get lined up. You know, one of them might be slow and all that stuff. The page is not going to be performant. GraphQL takes a different angle to it. GraphQL treats the data that an API serves back as kind of like a graph. So there are all these different nodes, they're all interconnected, they're a graph. And what the client does is not say, hey, give me this thing, it goes to one API. Give me this other thing, it goes to the other API. Instead, what it does is it queries this graph, which is sitting on the server, but it uses this query language to get exactly the data that it wants. So an Amazon front-end client would query this GraphQL instance, and it's going to say, I want, as a result of my query, I want the logged-in user, the products that they've used, they have ordered, their current orders, their favorite products, right? It's one query. It's going to make all these different requests in that query, and it's going to send it. The GraphQL server is going to return back, fulfilling all of the things that's asked in the query, kind of like a SQL statement, but here it's, you know, querying the graph. So this is what's referred to as GraphQL, graph query language, right? You're making a query to get a bunch of different things on the graph, which may not always be the single resource that a REST API provides. And then the client gets all that information to show that page in one shot. You don't have to create a new API for it. Similarly, you go to the products page, the products page is going to be like, give me this product details, the description, the reviews for this product. Again, one query goes out and then the response comes back with all the things that that query asked for. It makes it easy to get all the data that you want without making multiple calls. So these are understandings, these are agreements between the client and the server, which is what is an unofficial protocol. So it's not a formal uh, protocol. So yeah, that's the difference between REST and GraphQL. GraphQL is in use in a lot of places where you want to optimize this exchange. You want to make it dynamic and you're treating state data on the server like this graph that can be queried by different clients to get exactly what they want. How can I author a technical book? How do you approach publication? So a lot of publications actually invite people to apply and write kind of like a draft. With a lot of these things, again, it's a bit of a chicken and egg thing uh, when, you upload, when you approach like a big publishing company and say, I have this idea for a book and I would like to publish on your, on your platform. They will be like, what books have you written? Right? It's it's a bit of a chicken and egg thing. Or what background do you have that demonstrates your expertise? So usually what ends up happening is when you have gained enough experience and enough technical know-how to write a book, that experience will usually have some side effect. Okay, it'll be like some big project that you've worked on or some big contribution to open source. You can't just get that experience and that expertise in a void, right? There has to be some side effect of it. So that is what is your, going to be your way in, right? Somehow, you know, you send, you're asking me this question, I'm going to assume that you are that expert and you have done something that's significant that you can showcase. If you cannot showcase, I would say work on showcasing that, presenting that somehow, and then use that to approach a publication. It's not going to be easy because A, it's... You know, book publishing is going through a little bit of, um, I wouldn't say uh, difficulty of any sort. It's just that it has it has a huge competition in terms of other ways people learn today, right? Earlier, the only way people would learn was using books. But these days, it's like most people go to something like YouTube or they just pick up a course. So books aren't like the default mechanism in which people learn. And as a result, book publishers have taken different approaches. They've gone into video course creation, for example. So there are a lot of other opportunities. So the reason I'm saying this is don't just focus on like, okay, I want to write a book. Again, I gave the advice earlier as well. Think about the why. Why do you want to write the book, right? And if it is just to convey information, see if book is really the right way to do it. And I'll also tell you, writing a book is hard. It's very, very hard. It's It sounds very simple and it feels simple when you start. But once you start getting into it, it's it's ridiculously hard. So make sure you have a good reason for why you want to write a book. How can I get the most out of your Spring Boot tutorial? By actually paying attention, following the content, repeating the content if you don't understand something. And this is true not just for my tutorial or for anything. It's repeating the content until you get it and then doing a project, right? Build something of your own and apply the things that you've learned in the course and you will get the most out of my Spring Boot tutorials. I started learning Spring, Spring Boot, looking into your videos, but those playlists you've done is like nine years back. 
The question is, are those videos on Spring still up to date? Really, nine years back? Really? It's been that long? Whoa. Maybe I should refresh it. See, there are there are so many so many courses to make and so little time. Well, I'll have to find the time. So I have a course called uh, Spring Boot Quick Start. That should be very much applicable. You can you can even watch that today and you should be good. And that's not nine years old. That's, I think, a bit newer. I think four years old or something like that. The Spring playlist that I have done, I have like three playlists, right? So one is called Spring Core. One is Aspect-Oriented Programming with Spring. And the third one is Data Access with Spring. Those are beginning to show signs of age. So for example, I teach about XML-based configuration in those courses. And nobody does XML-based configuration now, right? Well, some people do, but very, very few, right? And most of them use annotations, for example. In those courses, I don't cover stereotype annotations, which are kind of like essential stuff today. So those ones are aging a little bit. So if you want to pick those playlists, pick the uh, the Spring Boot one first. Make sure you understand that. And th that doesn't have a prerequisite. So you can kind of jump into the Spring Boot playlist. You should still be good to go. What's your take on fake coding experience in Java? You mean writing fake experience on your resume. I'm guessing that's what it is. I don't like it. I can honestly say that I have never lied on my resume. Never, not even once, right? Not a single element on my resume in my career has been a lie. Is that something that everybody should do? I'm not saying that. I don't have a position for what others do. It's just my personal stance on it. There are things that are very subjective, okay? Like, for example, you know, I have had people ask me in an interview, like, how do you rate yourself on a scale of one to five in Java? And I sometimes give like a three or a four or whatever, right? Am I lying there? I don't know, because I don't know what's true, right? That's about the extent of my lie if you can call it that i'm being trying to be honest there but it could be a, a different number from what they're uh, expressing or what they're expecting so yeah i don't think lying is a good idea because i look at getting a job as, as something you're doing for yourself as well as something you're doing for the company right you are you want to get a job that not only pays you more but also you're going to have a good experience there and your life is going to not be miserable when you join. And I feel like when people lie on their resume, the more they lie to get in, the more miserable their life is going to be after they get in. And if you want to have a miserable career in order to earn more, lying is probably not the way to go. There are other miserable jobs you can take, which is going to pay you more. So yeah, that's never been, I, I've never understood that. Like I want to make sure when I get a job, I'm setting myself up for success there. And the best way I can do that is by making sure I represent my true uh, position and know that I'm going to be doing well there. Of course, company could be lying, in which case if I, that gets found out when I get into the job, and I realize the company has been lying about what the job is about, then I can leave and it's not on my conscience, right? But I don't want to make the situation worse for myself from my end, right? I don't want to be the culprit in making myself miserable, if that makes sense. So I, I have never lied on my resume and I don't think I'm going to lie on my resume because, yeah, I don't want that. I don't want that hit. It's not worth it. This is a common response that I get, you know, to kind of justify the lying on the resume, right? But I have to move. And I'm not going to get that job unless I lie, right? So this is a common example, right? Somebody's working on support and they want to get into development, right? They are going to put on their resume. They're going to be honest. They're going to put on their resume that they want, uh, they've been doing support, right? The company that they're going to apply to is looking for somebody who's done product development, who's done coding rather than just, you know, babysitting somebody else's code. And they're going to look at this and go, no, we're going to go with somebody who's done development. How do you break the cycle, right? What I have found to be the best way to break such cycles is to do a, a lateral shift in the company that you're already in, okay? So it is going to be a little bit of work. It's not going to be easy, but it is good in the long run, okay? And here's how. So let's say you're in a support job and you want to get into product development. 
let's say I'm in that situation. What I will do is I'll look for development teams in that company. Okay. If there are no development teams in the company, I'm going to pick up a support role in some other company which has development teams, right? I'm going to switch to another job which has the the horizontal movement that's possible for me, okay? So I'm going to talk to the development team. I'm going to try and find out what they do. Then I will ask them, I'm going to look at their code reviews, right? And I'm going to see, hey, is there is there some help that I can do, right? Can I Can I pick up a small task? Can I work on it? And I'm going to be doing this in my spare time, right? I'm going to ask the manager, hey, can I spend 10% of my time working on this thing? I'm really passionate about this. I want to learn. The manager says, yes, then great. The company is going to be paying you to explore that option. But if the manager says no, well, I would do it in my own spare time because this is my career, right? I want to, I want to do this. So I invest some time learning about it. I invest some time learning what that team is doing. And uh, I make a pull request. Whether they like it or not, I'm going to make a pull request and I'm going to start getting involved. People have different reactions, but if you have a good relationship with that team, it might, it might work in your favor and they might go, well, okay, thank you for the help. And I kind of get involved in that area, right? So what you're doing is you're building that area of your resume so that you're not lying, but then you're also getting that experience. Now, why this is important is there are a couple of reasons. One, you get to test that out and see if it's for you, right? You might not like that new shift that you want to make. And on the other hand, you're also getting that experience. Let's say you like it. Now, not only do you know that that's the area you want to go, you also have some experience, right? So you can go honestly tell on your resume that you have that experience and uh, you can approach further prospects in that area a little more confidently, okay? So that's that's the way out, not lying. Lying is not going to help you there. So this is a very common response that I get to somehow justify the lie and I don't see that as a good justification. But the other most common response that I get is, well, everybody else lies. Well, no, not everybody else lies. There is a percentage who lie, but why does it affect you? It affects you only when you are applying for a job and among the other applicants who have applied for that same job, there is one person who had lied, okay? The percentage of liars is not that much that you have to worry about that, right? The chances of another candidate applying to that same job that you've applied to and they have lied is very, very less, okay? So that's not a reason for you to lie, okay? Other people lie, they apply to other jobs, not your concern. It affects you only if they're applying to that same job, right? So since the chances are less, that's not an excuse either. So yeah, I'm not a fan. You might be a fan. It's 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 a, it's a personal morality. It's personal ethics. So you know, I I can obviously only speak for for my opinions. That's my AMA after all. So I get to share my opinions. So yeah, hopefully that that clarifies.